we're going to start the class teaching portion. And uh, we're going to start and pick up where we left off last week a bit. And we're going to start with a diagram that we had last week. We're going to add to that diagram a little bit. <clears throat> so, we're going to put that on the board right here. And uh, we obviously have a body. Adam was created with a body from the dust of the ground. And he had a soul. And he had a nature, human nature, spirit. And spirit can be applied to the soul as well. They're both spirit kind. Spirit means unseen motivator. It's a generic word that covers a lot of ground. It can mean a lot of things. But this is actually a nature which is specific. And this is a soul which is specific. To identify them, a soul is a person you are. When in Acts, they said 3,000 souls were saved, as 3,000 people were saved, individuals. Uh, and the the um, second chapter Acts. And so that is the individual we are. That's the personality, more than just our mind, will, and emotions. It is actually who we are. We are a soul. In God's eyes, we are a person. But we have a species. We are a human species. We're not monkeys. We didn't come from apes. We are human. We were created that way from the very beginning. Uh, the human spirit is the nature that we have. The soul is a person we are. So the person we are has a species, human. That's the way Adam was created. Everything was pure, everything was perfect. Everything up. Is that clear? Everybody can see that? What happened is <clears> that <throat> God told Adam in the beginning, don't eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. <clears throat> that day you'll show you that. Um, he told Eve, and what happened is that <clears throat> Eve talked to Satan, Satan talked to Eve, and they discussed the options of knowing evil and uh, the tree that they're not supposed to eat of, the poisonous tree. And she considered Satan's advice, and then she ate of that tree. That moment, her nature died, the light went out. It didn't fall down flat or cease to exist or, or go neutral, but instead it became corrupted. The light went out and it became a corrupted human nature. Now, there's another part that we'll add here that we are created with a heart. The Bible talks a lot about the heart. The heart is basically like a transmitter of information and emotions. It'll transmit to the soul things that are put into the heart. This nature puts darkness in the heart. So the heart becomes darker. Now there's options and stuff, and it happens today as well as it happened to Adam and Eve. And we can see that in Romans 1, 21 and 22. So let's go ahead and turn there. Romans 1, 21 and 22. And what happened is that our heart can be compartmentalized. It often is, just like our physical heart has different compartments. This has information that is fed to the soul from different sources. And uh, what happens is we can have a divided heart. And that's why Jesus, uh, God says in the Ten Commandments that he wants us to love God with his whole heart. So we have options there regarding our heart. But our heart is where we have a lot of information fed to our soul. That doesn't make the information true or good. It could be deceptive information, and that is the case when it happened to be darkened by the nature that was plugged into it. So their heart became dark. Fear entered in. They, they experienced a new emotion in the garden of Eden. Fear. Eve distrusted God, so she didn't have her whole heart dedicated to God. So basically, God wants us to have him in our heart, and that way we'll have love in our heart, and truth and light in our heart. Let's go ahead and read Romans 1, 21 and 22. Because that, when they took God, they glorified them not as God, neither who were thankful, but because it reigned in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. So their heart was darkened, and thinking that they were wise, you see that a lot today with the teachings of higher education about evolution. There's nothing more foolish than evolution if you really look into it. The long odds of evolution is like the winning the lotto three times in a row. And then you have better chances of winning the lotto three times in a row than apes becoming humans. And not only that, but where did apes come from? 
and they're just a big bang well where the light come from. It just goes back and back. If you take God out of the equation, which they do, and that's the only reason they came up with this, is because they don't want to acknowledge God as soon as they became fools and I believe the impossible, and they are impossible. All the intricacies in our own body, just the way our eyes work, the way our universe works, it's impossible for that to be an accident. There needs to be a creator. It's like, no, we created this watch. It's an accident. I don't think so. Somebody made this watch. And so basically, it's the same thing in creation. That's the first thing, the light of creation comes to every person. And so we can see that what happened is that everybody will experience the light of God at some point in your life. You can talk to your soul through the ear gate, eye gate, and uh, influence the heart to accept him. He knocks on the door of the heart and says, we are let me into your heart. And that's what happens is uh, every person, and let's take a look at John 1, 9, has an opportunity. God to make sure that every person will have an opportunity, and if they're not old enough <coughs> to have that opportunity at this time, they don't have that opportunity, as we'll see in later classes at another time. So I make sure that everybody receives information that there is a creator and that he can influence their life, be a part of their life. And uh, so let's take a look at John 1 9. The true light should give light to every man with coming into the world. So the true light is God, Jesus. He says he's the truth, life. And uh, he comes to every person, every soul that comes into the world. So everybody's going to have a chance. Let's drop down to John 3, John 3, 19 and 20. Uh, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men love darkness instead of light, because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and will not come into the light, for fear that his deeds will be exposed. So that's the biggest reason, the influence of this fallen human nature, contaminating the heart of darkness, selfishness, corruption of all sorts, becomes resistant to the light of God coming in. But the soul can make a choice in spite of all that. Now there's times when the soul is so wrapped up in this stuff, they're impenetrable. But there is a moment, and it comes through prayer, different things, when the soul is separated. The Bible says the word of God is able, sharper and powerful than two edged sword, able to separate soul and spirit. For the use for the purpose of um, Communicate to the soul truth, light. <laughs> so everybody have that moment of truth. And they're going to be judged. They'll be held accountable for what they do with it. Now many decide, I'm not going to go with it. I'm going to um, do uh, what I please. Or my soul, my uh, soul will listen to my old nature and walk in deception and darkness. If you reject the light, you're going to have darkness. That's just no way to it. No, no way around that. Let's take a look at. Uh, John, John 1 9. John chapter 1. We just heard that. We just heard that. Okay, that's all. Yeah, we just went through both of them. No, um, we're going to look at Ephesians 2 1 through 3. i roll this up a little bit. I'll see. I'm trying to figure out where I'm at on the notes. I'll see the notes in this distance a little bit. But there's one more thing we can add to the diagram before I sit down. Ephesians 2 1 through 3. <clears throat> Go ahead and read that when you got it. And you have the and, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. During in time past we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in time and time, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So by nature, this won't get to heaven, strange. This is 
what puts us under God's judgment, condemnation, because of what we're doing to his creation and to each other and to ourselves. We're destroying things that God loves. Um, so bottom line is, this is the problem in the world today. This will not be allowed in heaven. Heaven is perfect. None of this will be a part of heaven. It's so a part of this life we deal with. It. This is where warfare is going on. This is where satanic rule actually dominates in some areas. The more we give Satan power, the more he will take it and rule with it and dominate and crush what God wants to do for people. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, John 1, 12. But there's options. Like I said, light comes to everybody. There's an option for everybody, no matter who they are. Um, Saul was a great example of that. He was a very religious person, a Pharisee, and he was killing Christians and putting them in jail. He was on the road to do the very same thing when, through prayers of his relatives, God struck him down off his horse, and he was confronted with the light of Jesus, to blind him and so forth. And then he realized, whoa, I'm on the wrong side. Here he thought he was on the right side, very religious. This whole country was all united behind him in a sense, all the Pharisees and a lot of people, the religious side of the people and stuff. And yet this little sect of Christians and followers of Jesus was growing and he's trying to stamp it out. Mm -hmm. And then he realizes, you know what? That's the kingdom of God. He's fighting against. And he was transformed by that light. And he was actually the worst enemy of the church at the time. So the light come and does come to everybody. Prayer enhances the opportunities that, that person will have. And more often, that light will come to more of their heart will be prepared. But still, their person's choice. God won't make the choice for us. But he will influence us. And so we'll say, if we're not careful, we will listen to wrong influences and be deceived. But here in this verse, we have opportunities. Those way of John 1, 12. Yet to all who receive him, to those who believe, in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Okay. And that is the right to become children of God. I like the way King James puts it. Let's read that in King James as well. Okay. But as many as received him, to them gave him power to become the sons of God. Mm -hmm. to them that believe on his name. I like that word power even better than right. Because the power is in the Holy Spirit. When we ask him into our heart, the Holy Spirit will come in and he'll communicate with our heart and he will illuminate our heart. I thought this might happen. Do you? Preparation for the eraser? And so uh, we're going to have to do special effects here. Yeah. We've got to get the effects ready for illuminating the heart and uh, driving out the darkness. Uh, but the bottom line, to be a Christian, and we discussed this last week, we need to have Jesus, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit in our heart, and with that, He brings the divine nature, the nature of God, comes in. So we have two natures as a Christian. We have our fallen human nature we inherited from Adam, then we have the new nature Christ has provided as a free gift. That's the born again experience. This is what the Bible means by being born again of the Spirit. And so, thank you. So, He will. Illuminate our heart. Hey, Rick, for the truth. Yes. I was just wondering, uh, couldn't a better word be purifying? Purifying, purifying our heart is right. Do I have the wrong word? No, that's the right word. Okay. So, nice. So, that is uh, the situation. The heart is ground zero, it is a battleground. The Bible has a lot to say about the heart and uh, both the bad things and good things and our opportunities to work on making our heart better. And let's take a look at um, um, 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. And this describes the fact that we have a new nature as a Christian. It's referred to as the divine nature. We participate and partake of the divine nature through getting into God's Word. Looking at God's Word in the Bible. Listening to God's Word over um, different sources that are available to us. 
So uh, it can come in through our eye gate, our inner gate, purify our heart, because we're responsible for what we allow growing to grow in our heart. But we'll get to that in a moment. First John, or go ahead and read that, Second Peter 1, 3 and 4. According as his divine power given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So that's the divine nature we can partake of. That's the nature of God. And uh, that's what's in us. Uh, as Christians, we invite him. We talked about that last week. So let's take a look at Proverbs 4, 23. <clears throat> so our heart is extremely important. God wants us to give him our heart, our whole heart. Well, it's up to us to do that. Satan wants to have our whole heart. He's had our whole heart in the past. We're born with this, and it tends to corrupt our heart. So our heart is transformable. You can be changed. This nature will never change. It's always evil. This nature will never change you. It's always good. So let's go ahead and read that. Um, Proverbs 4, 23. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Okay. <coughs> Let's hear that in King James as well. It's good to have a couple translations on it. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. So our heart is very important, and we're told here to guard our heart. Watch what's going Satan is going to continue to plant things in our heart. The old nature is going to continue to plant things in our heart. Seeds of devastation, seeds of darkness will continue on a daily basis to be planted in our heart. God will plant his seed, the word of God in our heart as well, if we pay attention to what he's saying and what he said in the Bible and so on. But these evil seeds, we can help them being planted, but we can do something about them growing. And what we do through the world and through the inner nature that's fallen and through all the influences that come to our heart, we can go and inspect guard, but inspect and uproot those seeds that are bad thoughts. As uh, one famous preacher put it, get rid of that stinking thinking. Mm -hmm. And this is where that stinking thinking comes from. It comes from your nature going through the heart, darkening it, influencing the soul, and giving you actions and thoughts that are ungodly, unbiblical, untrue, deceptive. And you don't know if you're deceived until you see the truth. So sometimes it's a surprise to some people. Wow, I believe that all my life. It's not true. I like to learn the truth early and not believe the false thing all my life. So that's been my first since I was very young. So the bottom line is we have to guard our heart. And we have to uproot the seeds that are planted there that are not according to the Bible, that are basically hard for us to reconcile with what God's Word says. They're contradictory. So let's take a look at uh, Ephesians 4, 22-24. Leave that up there like that for a little bit. <clears throat> Ephesians four twenty two through twenty four. The Christian has two natures. The King James calls it uh, the old man and the new man. So uh, that's addressed here in Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. We'll probably read both versions for that because I like the way that New International actually calls them nature, but I like the way the King James actually uh, labels them as the old man, new man. So let's go ahead and read the New International first. You were taught with regards to your former way of life to put off your own self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your mind and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Okay, I thought it was natures in there. Must be another way. Well, let's go ahead and read the King James. I like the, instead of self, the self could include the soul, and that's the problem with some of these translations. 
the, the King James uses soul more often than any other translation. So it's consistent. So self isn't always our soul. This is self right here, our human nature. And when God says to deny ourself, he's not saying to deny our soul, our self here, our personality. He's saying deny this selfish nature. That's what God wants us to do. That's the cross we bear. This is what we got to crucify. This is what we got to deny. It's all this darkness from the old nature. Nothing with our soul should be really considered denied unless it's going in the wrong direction, you know, directly. But this is not what God wants to um, basically um, crucify. It's this. And then by doing that, we're lining up with the light and acknowledge that we have a new nature. The old nature is crucified. And I uh, like the way the, they put it here in the King James. Let's go ahead and read that in the King James. As we put off concerning the former conversation, the old man. So I like the old man, new man thing. Which is corrupt according to the sinful lust. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that he put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Okay, so that's the... This is the old man. Actually, these are masculine. This is feminine, very so. And the bottom line is that the old man is corrupt. We put that off. We, we don't allow it to influence us. And we put on the new man that's created. Now, the creation wasn't that it's created. It's not created. It is God. It's always been around. But the relationship became created the day it was born again. And you became, you became your soulmate. And so this is sort of like a marriage relationship, husband and wife, giving identity to the fruit that would be bare. So basically, who we identify with. Do we identify with the old man? It's not us, it's the old person, the old identity, the old nature. Or do we identify with the new man? God, the man God wants us to make us. Now man in the Bible carries power and identity. That's why the man is often used when it talks about lineage and different things as well as sons are often used because they get the inheritance. Not trying to do away with uh, the gender thing, or uh, make the gender thing a big deal, but it's not really talking about gender, but instead all the things that are con connected to what it means is from the biblical point of view, from the man handing down the nature to the sons and daughters, but also the daughters, they bear fruit, which men cannot do, but the body, you know, physically. But the bottom line is that there's different programs, different roles for each thing. And uh, so basically, when the Bible seems to talk about men a lot, he's talking about mankind, not just guys. But uh, the identity of man came from Adam. And so we all kind of go back to that. And the identity of the new man comes from Jesus. So there's two families there um, that we have and an opportunity to be a part of. And we're going to be part of the family of Adam, but we can be a part of the family of God. And uh, let's take a look at Colossians 3, 2 through 10. Let's read that in King James, be consistent. Uh, this is where I believe the New International Action uses the word nature. But since we are talking about the old man, new man, the King James continues to use that same theme. Colossians 3, 2 through 10. Yeah, 2 through 10. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication and cleanliness, beloved, affection, evil, comprehension, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things say the wrath of God coming on the children of the forbidden, in the which he also walked sometime when he lived in them. But now he also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, Filthy 
So there you have it. We can't put off the old man. And we can't put on a new man. It's sort of like clothes in a sense. The identity of clothes in the military, uh, and clothes clarity identity, and uh, you recognize you know, the rank and the, the type of uh, military they're involved with. And in the same way that the old man is like grave clothes. He identifies us with the grave, with death, with darkness, with corruption. We take off those clothes. We take off that identity. We don't identify with that anymore. We put on the new man, the armor of God, the armor of light, as the Bible uh, lists and uh, in, uh, in different pieces of that armor. And that's a new identity. That's what it means to be in Christ. It means that you have put on the identity of God's child. And uh, you walk in newness of life. It's a, it's a completely different perspective. If you got guilt and stuff like that, that's all attached to the old man. If you, if you uh, put on Christ, you realize you can be set free from guilt of uh, all the things that are in the past and are connected to the old man because you become a new creation. You become a child of God with a new identity, new heritage, new family, new uh, future. So let's take a look at uh, the fruit that results from these two different uh, men. Um, Galatians 5, 16 through 21. We'll start with the old man. Um, it's listed some there. We'll read that in New International probably. Because some of those words we don't recognize and stuff. But Galatians 5, 16 through 21. So I saw, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. Okay, and the Spirit is contrary to the sinful nature. Thank you. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious, sexual immorality, uh, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish selfish ambition, uh, dissension, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the... Let's stop there for a minute. Sorry. Um, now that is a strong statement. A lot of people are taking that to the point that the soul will inherit the kingdom of God. But what's referring to is this, and this attitude, and this heart being darkened will not enter the kingdom of God. Uh, the fruit that I was just mentioned there won't be found in heaven at all. There will be no temptations for darkness or deception. Uh, we will know the truth and be so obvious. Uh, there will be places where we can learn more about the truth and, and uh, the situations that sin is, uh, how it's corrupted this beautiful, perfect world. And it just took one. And then that one sin grew. It was just eating of the knowledge of good and evil. And from that one sin, we have a very corrupted world and a very corrupted society because it corrupted the nature. And this won't be a part of heaven. It can't. Uh, it's but like a virus. And wherever this virus goes, it contaminates. It infiltrates and distorts and destroys and contaminates. So this will be dealt with before we get to heaven. It won't enter. But this is eternally with us. We talked about that last week. Once he comes in, he'll never leave us. This is our new identity. This makes us a child of God. This transforms our soul. So he's not talking about your soul, but our nature, human nature that's fallen, won't enter. The things that produce this fruit uh, won't be in heaven. Um, isn't a part of the kingdom of God. It's a part of the kingdom of Satan. Actually, this has been called the child of Satan. Um, it's because Satan was the one that fostered this corruption originally. Let's go ahead and look at the fruit of the Spirit now, the fruit of the new nature. It's found in the next few verses, verses 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. 
Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the sinful nature. It's clear right there. Is that good? Um, with its passion and desire. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Okay, what verse is that? 26. 26. 22 through 26. Okay, that's, uh, that's a little bit more, and we wanted to talk about 25. It is our choice to crucify um, the old nature, to deny the old nature. Uh, it is a choice we make uh, on a daily and regular basis. And so it doesn't bear that fruit uh, that starts in the heart, starts in the mind. And uh, if it's left there to grow and flourish and take over, it'll, it'll affect our actions and our words. So thank you for that. And uh, we're going to go ahead and look at uh, another thing, uh, that when we get this fruit and we have this fruit in our history and we live daily choosing which one we're going to connect to, who we're going to identify with, we will naturally produce the fruit of that nature. Uh, the divine nature will produce naturally good fruit. And the fallen human nature will produce naturally bad fruit. And everything is going to be judged at the judgment seat of Christ for the Christians. And we're going to start looking at that. And uh, so let's take a look at uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. There's a judgment, there's a time of accountability for every single person created. Uh, for Christians and people that live during these times and have lived in the past that are godly people, people that are members of God's family, will all be at this judgment seat of Christ. This is where we get rewards. <clears throat> this happens after the rapture. It happens before the wedding feast of the Lamb and before Christ's return to the earth. Uh, so after we're raptured, uh, we talked about in previous classes. Uh, we will go to be with Christ, and we'll be uh, examined in a sense. Uh, we talked about that, uh, this parable that was describing that and different things. Take, let's take a look at uh, this description. Uh, the fact is, what are the, what's going to happen there? Um, 1 Corinthians 3, 11 through 15. <laughs> well, of a foundation can no man lay and that is laid, which is, is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work should be made manifest. For the day shall declare, declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work for what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So it's very clear that at this judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, it's a judgment of our actions, our works, our lifestyles, our choices. It's not a judgment of whether we're saved or not. We're already saved. That, that decision has been sealed here on earth before this ever happened by receiving the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus into our life and becoming part of God's family. That's permanent. So as it says at the end there, we ourselves be saved, but we may suffer losses. Um, so that's what happens at this judgment seat and we're gonna get rewards, but there's also opportunities we're gonna see that we lost rewards. We could have had things, we should have had things. God wanted us to have these things, but we made the wrong choices. We didn't crucify the old nature. We instead walked with the old nature and bore the old nature's fruit. It's all going to be eliminated, burned up. Uh, it's temporary. It's not a part of our future. All of that will be part of our past, distant, and completely separated from us as it isn't even connected to us at one point. As it's no longer connected to us, we are set free from it completely. But in this life, we're still dealing with it. Let's take a look at Luke 12, 2 and 3. At this judgment seat, nothing will be hidden. There's no censorship of, well, that's bad. and censor that. No, everything's going to be seen. Everything's going to be um, examined. And it says both good and bad. It's all going to be tested by fire. 
Some things will be eliminated, some things will remain. And uh, the Bible is very clear over and over though, is uh, there's nothing hidden here. Misunderstood things will be clarified and uh, both good and bad will be revealed. Luke 2, or Luke 12, I mean, verses 2 and 3. Be on your guard against the uh, yeast of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. There is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed or hidden that will not be made known. So everything is going to be understood, everything is going to be seen, everything is going to be judged and tested by this uh, judgment fire. And let's take a look at 1 Corinthians 4 5. Even things we don't even understand about ourselves, we're going to see more clearly and understand ourselves better than we've ever understood ourselves before. People we had conflicts with that were other Christians will be there. We're going to understand the motivator of those conflicts. It was always the old man. It was always Satan trying to divide us, trying to keep us from loving each other. This is how love will naturally transpire after this judgment, because we'll start understanding where the hatred came from, where the confusion came from, where the darkness came from. It all comes from the old man. So let's take a look at uh, this uh, verse, uh, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring, he will bring to the light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. So that's a key verse to really remember. This is talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Everything, even our motives, which God's very concerned about our motives. He can see our motives better than we can see our own motives a lot of times. And they're all going to be ex exposed, seen, whatever. But it's going to be in a good way. It's going to be to set us free from the evil. The reason why all this stuff has to be moved on, gone, separated from us. And the things that were motivated correctly, sometimes the smallest things. God says, you know what, that was awesome. You're going to get an eternal reward for that. For instance, let's take a look at Matthew 12, 36. God is looking at every detail. And sometimes we don't realize, you know, we're writing our own script on a daily basis, what God is going to examine. And if we understood these things, sometimes we would write a different script. But many people don't think they're going to be held accountable. They think they're animals, so they're going to live like an animal. But they're going to be surprised one day when their life is put up on Judgment Day and examined. And they have to hold account, um, be, accounted, be held accountable for their actions. But even the smallest things, let's take a look at this verse. Um, Matthew 12, 36. But I say unto you, that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So God's even keeping track of our words, every single word. So we should be, and our words come from our heart, the Bible says. So we got to watch what's in our heart, guard our heart. And then watch what comes out of our mouth, because that will actually tell us what's going on in our heart. Sometimes if we listen to ourselves talk for a while, we realize, you know, I'm really being negative. I'm really being depressed. You know, my heart must be having some issues. And uh, so we can actually look at those things and start to deal with what's coming out of our mouth. And uh, figure out where they're authored. Are they the old man? Maybe I've got to disconnect from that. Are they the new man? Well, then they're going to be more positive, more loving, because God says he wants us to love him with our whole heart and then love each other, his creation. So when we do that, then everything is basically covered with this attitude of love, motivation of love. And God's looking at that, it'll affect our words. Uh, let's take a look at uh, Mark 9, 41. It'll affect our actions. Mark 9, 41. I tell you the truth. Anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ will certainly not lose his reward. 
So even a cup of water done with the right attitude will be rewarded, as it says right here. So sometimes it's the smallest things that sometimes advance us a better reward than some big thing done without the right attitude and without the right motivation. So basically, our motivation is very important. We need to see what's in our heart on a regular basis and test it and guard it and purify it. We are in charge of our heart and we can allow God to be full in charge of our heart, giving them our whole heart instead of just a part of our heart to make a big difference in our lifestyle. Let's take a look at Matthew. We're going to look real quick at Matthew 22, 10 through 13. And uh, this is a parable we talked about earlier last week. And it's what happens at this judgment seat of Christ after these things are examined. And, uh, <clears throat> and I want to read this in the King James Version. Matthew 22, 10 through 13. You know what, if you have a go ahead and read it in your shop. Okay. Go to the street corners and invite to Matthew the... 10, 13 through, uh, 22, 10 through 13 is right? Right. Okay, go oh, ahead. Okay. So the servants went out into the street and gathered <clears throat> all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Go ahead, next verse. Then the king told the attendants, tie him, tie him hands and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Okay, so basically this man is exposed. He's uncovered by the righteousness uh, that God provided. This is the old man. This is the old nature. This is where he's exposed and cut out, eliminated. And he's uh, basically destined for the lake of fire, as is described there. Uh, let's turn to Psalms 103.12. And this is what happens to purify us and make us quali uh, qualified for heaven. When the old man is removed from us, it perfects our heart. Our heart is only a single heart, then full of light, life, love. And our soul will be influenced by all those things, and it purifies our soul. We're all individuals. We all have different personalities. But we will all be motivated by what's good, not what's bad when it comes to after this judgment and after the old man is eliminated and the way it will be as eternity unfolds in heaven. Let's take a look at Psalms 103.12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. So, this is the time when that happens. That the old man then will be removed and the east and west never meet. North and south can meet, but the east and west will never meet. They're going two different directions. And for a Christian, this is the condition after this judgment seat of Christ is concluded. We'll have rewards according to our works. We have a new identity. It's a permanent identity, child of God. And that's the lineup removing sin and the sin nature, the old man, from us permanently. His identity will not be associated with us in heaven. We don't identify. We're a child of God. We're a new creation. So basically, that is what all of us will end up going through before the wedding feast of the Lamb, after the rapture, and the reason for the judgment seat of Christ is basically perfecting us, helping us to see ourselves for who we was, who we are, and identify that we're his child and the old man has lost all identity, all authority, all influences over our life and will be and is removed. It's called a circumcision of the heart done without hands. So let's take a look at 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Go 
Go ahead and read that. Any version. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. So that's what happened. Let's read that in King James. That's such a good verse. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So that's our destiny. And we are a new creature. We're actually part of that now by faith. But then it will be a reality. And as we see in Romans, we're going to close with this, Romans 8, 18 and 19. So let's go ahead and read that. Romans 8, 18 through 19. And we're going to close with this. But this is the destiny that every Christian has and the opportunity that we have to become a Christian and join God's family. Every person gets that opportunity. We'll be held accountable for a choice we make. If we make a bad choice, it could be devastating. God wants us and tells us to choose him, choose life. He gives us every opportunity to do so, but he won't choose for us. We must choose for ourselves to be part of God's family and receive his free gift. Let's read Romans 8, 18 and 19. Consider that our present sufferings are not worth pairing with the glory that will be revealed in us. Creation waits in eager ex expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. So that's what it is. is what, now, once again, the sons is used here because the son carries authority, identity from the father, and stuff like that. But it's all the children of God. We're all children of God, and uh, as we receive God's nature, and uh, in heaven, now uh, we'll see uh, in future classes what that's going to be like. But. Let's read that also. You got that in King James? We're still closing with this verse, but it is a good verse to uh, close on. And, and so let's read that also again. At 18, 19? Yes. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which should be revealed in, it, in us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. And that manifestation happens here when the old nature is removed. By faith, we walk in that nature, but then we'll be completely engulfed in that nature. It'll be the only thing we identify with. And uh, there'll be no temptation for deceptions or corruptions or anything of the like because we'll see it for what it is. And uh, that's the family of God that we are part of and destined for as our purification takes place at this judgment seat. And the rewards are ganned out. And we're going to talk about what happens after this next week. And uh, the wedding feast of, of Christ. And also the return to this earth. And uh, what all happens at that time. So thanks for joining us. And we're going to conclude this.